in new and in use cut content for Mushoku Tensei, how Roxy survived the labyrinth and was saved by Rudius. Let's check out what he has to say. How was it that Roxy survived in the labyrinth for so long? Eating monster meat. We only saw very little of what she actually went through, but a large part of it was a safe zone she managed to constantly find her way back to. It was a grueling struggle in which the more she tried to escape, the harder the journey became and the closer to despair she got. The way she survived wasn't so much about the survival itself though, but rather the way in which she overcame it. What I mean is that, as a lone mage in an extremely desperate situation, the mental part of it was just as important as the physical. The mind Seeing break. her come to terms with what seemed like imminent death really highlighted some parts of Roxy we haven't yet seen before. And that's the parts I want to share with you today. Okay. So, as we go through how it is Roxy survived in the labyrinth, you'll get to see more of this determined part of her that's intent on living. I swear to god he covered this last episode, did he not? Didn't he explain to us that she was just eating poisonous, you know, like, toxic monster meat? And water... She can just create water. Was that the anime telling us that, or did Annie just tell us that? I forget. Now, just a quick reminder that the new begin- Mugen merch! Y'all know what to do. Go to his merch store and, I don't know, buy some if you want. My personal favorite is this white shirt here. The Goddess of War. Sounds kind of cringe, but I don't know. Eris' eyes is kind of cute. Towards creating more amazing designs just like these. So, whether you want high-quality clothing or subtle anime-inspired streetwear, yep. both can be found right here on Mugen. Wonder how much he's selling these t-shirts for, bro. Wonder how much these t-shirts are going for. One of these days, bro. Give me, give me two to three years. When a channel goes over 100k, I'm gonna start fucking selling Costco white t-shirts. Empty blank t-shirts. At a markup price. And people are gonna buy them. And other people are gonna be like, what the fuck is going on? Why are people buying an empty white t-shirt? Fuck if I know, man. It's like a cultish following. Just like these. So, whether you want high-quality clothing or subtle anime, yeah, 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 yeah. we're gonna understand exactly what it is Roxy went through, then it's important to set the stage for where exactly she found herself. You see, this area here was actually one of two places she constantly found herself coming back to. The other was a small room which acted as her safe zone, and both were constant in an endless loop where Bunker and a possible. monster den. In fact, if Roxy was to make it back to the main path where everyone else was, she would first have to traverse over 30 one-way teleporters in perfect order without messing up once. <laughs> That's fucking imp 30 separate <laughs> without messing up once. Nah, that, it's, it's fucking, it's, you can't do that. It's impossible. It was pretty much like winning 30 coin flips in a row. Uh, what, what is um, 0.5 to the power of 30? Whatever that is times 100 is the percentage of that likelihood. That's fucking uh, not happening. Perhaps even harder since some rooms had more than one teleporter in them. That being the case, to say she was trapped was more like an understatement, and it all happened due to one simple misstep. She was evading an attack directed straight towards her, and right as she stepped back Whoopsies. in order to do so, she clumsily tripped and landed right onto a magic circle. So this is when they were all at the party together, this is when she got separated from the main party, right? It was a rookie mistake since she'd even reviewed where all the traps were beforehand. This brought her to a den filled with monsters, and it was actually the same one we saw her fighting in at the end of last episode. You may be wondering how she was there for an entire month, but yeah. I promise it'll all make sense once you understand the loop part of everything. Okay. So, while yes- Is she doing some shit like fucking COD zombies? You know? Call of Duty. Sometimes there's zombies, and how do you how do, how do you survive? The meta is basically rounding up these zombies in a pack and basically just like looping in a map in an order where it's just kind of safe to traverse over and over again. Was Roxy doing something similar? Where she was teleported and where she was found was one and the same. It's not exactly where she spent all her time. She was able to clear the initial wave that was waiting for her, then right as the next batch teleported in, she noticed one of the six teleporters around her wasn't being used by them. <gasps> this made her no wonder way. if monsters weren't at the other side of it, and sure enough, her assumption was right. So, after fighting her way over and teleporting again, what Roxy found on the other Bunker. side was a small, cramped area just tall enough for her to stand up in, and only long enough for one or two people to lie down in. It's it was an enclosed space where the only other thing present was a single teleporter. A mini bunker too small for monsters to teleport into, and one in which she would remain safe so long as she stayed. The Who made this teleportation circles, though? Do we know? Do we know any of the lore of, like, who marked these teleporters? It's not like they randomly spawned, right? 
someone actually drew these circles in. And the person who wrote the book was trying to understand, right? We don't have any answers, any lore on how these things are like created. But if you have like even like a bunker location, this teleporter, it sounds like this one was very intentional, right? It, it feels very intentional that in this confined space, there was just one teleporter acting almost like a bunker here. So it feels like, you know, there is some logic and real people that created these things, but I don't know. The teleporter know. next to her was one of the random ones, so this meant it could take her anywhere. Whether it be a den full of monsters or another narrow passageway, finding out was a risk that meant accepting that same danger of before all over again. Luckily, she could recoup her mana and rest without worry, but if she wanted to escape, this was the only way out. Now, mana and water were the things that she had an abundant supply of, but food was the one provision which was limited. Monster meat she time! She did pack enough to survive more than a few days, but just surviving wasn't what she had planned for herself. No, Roxy was very intent on escaping. Okay. As much as she wanted to think Paul and the others were coming to save her, there was a whole plethora of reasons why they couldn't. And it was that realization that helped her to steal her resolve and continue forward. What was the plethora of reasons? This fucking skill issue? So, after spending a day in the bunker, Roxy would take her chances with random teleportation and commence the loop which she would cycle through over and over again. She would find herself in an unfamiliar passageway, hop on whatever one-way teleporters seem safe, then mark every area to the best of That's her That's what ability. she was doing, almost like going course, in circles. as it is when dealing with this labyrinth, it was impossible to get your bearings no matter how skilled you were. Eventually, the journey would always just devolve into hopping on a teleporter and hoping to see something different. Unfortunately, Roxy wasn't so lucky, and it was after teleporting over and over again that she would once again be faced with the horde of monsters in the same den from last time. She immediately recognized the unused teleporter at the back, then fought her way to safety just as she did before bringing her right back to the bunker where she was however many hours or days ago. Roxy would then rest another day and venture out again, only to repeat the same process and end up right back here. We're just looping over it and over. It seemed whatever route of teleporters she took, they would always lead back to the den and subsequently this small little bunker. That's kind of lucky, right? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's, it's hell actually that we're stuck here rather than getting out, but kind of lucky that there is this bunker space that we just kind of go back to that we can just kind of hide out and rest. Resulting in an endless loop that got harder the more times she did it. So, as her body became exhausted and her food supplies low, eventually she had to start eating monster meat. Monster the meat. About these types of monsters, body food at the time. Their flesh was so incredibly toxic, the only way to eat them was to first detoxify them. This was how Roxy took care of her food problems, and it was to say the least taking its toll on her. I would like to see Roxy turn into Hajime from Arifura Teba, she's eating the fucking monster meat over and over again. What worried her more than the hunger, the tiredness, and the overall sense of dread though, was the thought of having to go back through the teleporter and do it all over again. You see, knowing what it was that awaited her on the outside was finally starting to make Roxy feel like she couldn't do it anymore. I mean, these were by no means your average monsters. They were intelligent to the point that they could coordinate and work together, so it was just a matter of time until they would adapt and find a way to beat Roxy. Intelligent monsters are fucking scary, man. Like, even if they're not, like, so smart, but they're just slowly getting intelligence. Like, Kaiju 8, for example, right? The scariest shit is these monsters learning to how to talk and, like, reason and be like, oh, I know what you're gonna do next now. It's like, oh my god, you're actually fucking learning. And, like, the whole pressure of doing this over and over again and not working that's gonna like make your mentality kind of snap and you're gonna be like holy shit get me out of here to the point you might actually just give up especially if she kept approaching and escaping the exact same way she did the last five or ten times a month of on and off combat was ample time for any opponent to adapt so because roxy knew her enemies were where do you think she pooped you, you, you think she's like throwing dookie at the monsters? You think there's like a, like a toilet area? How, how, how does she like, like she can like wash herself with like water. Maybe she pooped and like fucking use earth <laughs> magic to like bury the poop underneath. I don't fucking know. For waiting and learning, she was terrified by the thought of finally being overcome by them. She knew they knew that she was trapped and it was for that reason that she she knew that they knew that she knew that she felt like death was right around yeah. the corner for her. It was a terrible feeling that shook her all the way down to her core. 
Yes, time and time again she'd seen adventurers meet their end, yet no matter how much that reminded her, her fate was going to be the same. It's the she poor kids again, the demon content. The I swear to god, any news got something, I don't know, he keeps showing us the imagery of these poor kids back in season 1, remember the kids? Where Rudy was like, wait, Rudy, don't do anything, and then the kids fucking died, remember, remember that? They keep showing us them fucking dying over time and over. Time and time again she'd seen adventurers meet their end, yet no matter how much that reminded her, her fate was going to be the same, she still found herself frightened by the thought of being on its doorstep. As much as she wanted to think that she was prepared for it, there was still so much more that she wanted to do with her life. Such Dreams as? that filled her with regret for not having achieved them yet. She wanna get married? She still wanted to teach despite having no talent for it, and she still wanted to fall in love. Does she actually have no talent to teach? Is this true? She was teaching Rudy well, or could you just say Rudy did well because he was so talented? Does she have an ins- I didn't know that there was an insecurity of like not being able to teach. Having achieved them yet. She still wanted to teach despite having no talent for it, and she still wanted to fall in love despite thinking she wasn't the most appealing. That's why after she'd finished saving Zenith, I think a lot of people find her appealing. I don't know where she got this notion, but like, Roxy is a very hot commodity in this world of Mushoku Tensei. I think a lot of people love her. Now, Talhand of course doesn't, because he just rolls the other way. She was planning to go back to the university and become a professor there. She'd reacquaint herself with the master she had a falling out with, then perhaps find a person she could fall in love with. Rudy. It was nothing more than a simple happiness she'd always envisioned for herself. But now that death was only one or two teleportation circles away, the only thing Roxy could think of was how her dreams won't come true anymore. She could only imagine just how terrible her death was going to be, and that brought with it a slippery slope straight into despair. Even so, it- I might just like- end myself with ice magic if i knew like these fucking 10 ton caterpillars these horde of monsters are coming for me and i knew that this is the end of the road i i don't know how the fuck they're gonna kill me but it's like i would probably shoot an icicle through my fucking head bro i would not let that happen it's because she didn't want to die and really wanted to live that roxy would muster up the courage to get up and leave her bunker again she would step foot back into that teleportation circle and continue traversing that same unfamiliar passageway she'd come through all those times before. A few new circles would then lead her right back to where she expected and once again Roxy would be face to face with that same den of monsters. This time things were a little bit different though since now that Roxy had been here almost 10 times, the monsters knew how it was she was getting away from them. They're learning! They identified the teleporter she kept using to escape, then used the corpses of the monster she slaughtered to block her access to it. That's what I'm talking about. They're mobilizing. They're using the corpse of the dead monsters to block it. This is getting fucking scary. You should not be able to strategize like this. This is not fair. The hundreds of monsters she wiped out on all her previous trips were now piled into a mountain creating Holy this impossible shit. barricade. So, if Roxy wanted to escape this time... I, I guess it's not like a video game where if you kill a monster, their bodies just kind of like disappear, right? This is like, nah, they just exist there as corpse. They're gonna fucking use it to block you. Not only would she have to kill all the monsters currently present, but she would also have to remove the wall of corpses currently blocking her exit. It was a near impossible task given the army-like formation the monsters were operating with. Remember how I said these monsters were intelligent? Yeah. Well, aside from being smart enough to block Roxy's exit, they were also coordinated enough to prepare this incredible siege. They had put iron crawlers in the front to act as defense, the spiders behind to provide offensive support, then the mudskulls in the back for that long-range damage. Mudskull's probably the one that organized this, right? It's not like every one of them are smart enough to figure it out. Right? Who do you think? Who do you think is the smartest here? The spider, the centipede thing, or like the mud skull? I think it's the mud skull that's like intelligent enough to coordinate everybody. How do you think like they're like? How do you think they communicate telepathically? Are they speaking monster language that we don't know? It was impeccable organization only possible on this floor of the labyrinth. All this still wouldn't have been enough to take out Roxy, but because more monsters kept teleporting in. There wasn't enough time to recoup, let alone make progress on the barricade. The monsters had made it so that there was no escaping back to her bunker this time. That's when Roxy would start to get overwhelmed, and shortly after would come the part where her life would flash before her eyes. Oh, it did? It was a genuinely interesting moment that shed a bit of light into who she is and what she perceives as the core memories in her life. 
a deeper look into the defining moments of her character and how what she What she remember? Them. She remember Rudy? So, the first would be the disappointment of her parents, and this was when they first realized that she couldn't communicate like them. They did eventually teach her how to speak, but to her... Let's go back to season one content. So, I forgot about the whole thing of Roxy not being able to communicate, because she's obviously a demon, right? Different race compared to spirits, but these demons have separate demon language, but Roxy herself was not able to speak that language due to a curse. Why was it that she wasn't able to speak the same language as her tribe? I forgot that reasoning. Did they ever explain it? Or was it just some mysterious way of like, oh, she's just born and she could just not talk that language. It's a telepathic language, but she just doesn't have the skill. Why does she not have that skill? It's just, just genetics. Just unfortunately, she just couldn't. That's it. Got it. There is no deeper reasoning other than that, right? I forgot about that. Got it. She felt they only did so out of pity. It was a bit later that a traveling magician would leave a deep impression on her, and this was what would spark her interest in magic. Traveling magician? So eventually she would learn how to use basic... Who is this girl over here? Down below. She's probably really important, right? Do we kind of know? Tear water magic, then leave the village and join her first adventurer party. Huh. The four of them would travel together for years, but as soon as one ended up dying, the rest would disband and Roxy would go to the central continent. <laughs> wah, wah. It was here she would enroll into the University of Magic and then we had for a the fallout first time here. be exposed to a school environment. It was a whole new experience she'd never known before, yet once she became Roxy quite school fond arc. Of things, things were nice. Her grades were good and she was perceived as talented, but more than anything, she'd developed an ego. You see, after finding her master, she got a high ego. Tier water magic. The speed in which she picked it up led to her thinking she was amazing. Okay. Her master would then complain about how prideful she was, and that wasn't something Roxy was particularly. Roxy needs some correction, but this sounds funny. I want to see an egotistical Roxy at the school, like shitting on other kids. Fond of. So she would leave after graduating without saying anything, then set out for Asura and try to find work. What she thought would be incredibly easy, though, instead turned out to be quite the opposite. Yeah, just like back in the old days in Wishoku Tensei, it's just like, yeah, it's not just as simple as graduate college and just find a job. It's not that simple, dude. As it turns out, for whatever reason, a mage like her just wasn't employable. She would then be forced to move out to the countryside, We're unemployed, but even man. there, still no one wanted to hire her. That's when she would spot the ad for a home tutor in Fatoa, and just like that, Roxy would be introduced to Rudy. That's how it all came around! Damn. It's not like Roxy was specifically scouted because of her talents to, you know, teach Rudy, but it was like, damn. Roxy graduated college, top of her class, realized that the job market, the economy is in fucking recession. AI is taking over all the fucking jobs. Roxy was like, shit, I don't know where to fucking get a job. Went into the boonies and then suddenly, just looking up on Craigslist, she found a random ass posting from Paul and was like, you know what? I need money right now. Let me fucking go. In. And then that's how they met. Time in which she would be humbled by Rudy's own talent. It definitely did create this growing sense of yeah, and then when she went to the boonies and reluctantly accepted a job that she didn't really want, <laughs> this fucking toddler ass baby started fucking looking at her panties and then made her insecure of her own powers. Great life we're having. Envy, but at the same time, his own modest behavior made her respect him. It was after that that she would head to Sherine, explore labyrinths just on the outskirts, then teach Pax to no success whatsoever. Yeah, and get sexually assaulted by Pax, classic. Whatsoever. What a piece it of was shit. an experience that showed her just how bad she was at teaching, while at the same time highlighted just how amazing Rudy was. Yeah, so that's the insecurity of the teaching part. I'm like, was Roxy actually that bad at teaching? It's... But it, when you look at the Rudy, it's, it's, it's just... Rudy was just better than Pax. Rudy didn't really... He needed less guidance. But someone like Pax is like, okay, now are you actually good at teaching? Can you, like, discipline these kids to listen to you and actually teach? That's, like, an actual true talent for teaching where Rudy was just kind of, like, kind of easy because he's already so talented. Then, once her job became too disgusting to bear, she immediately too left disgusting to bear. Alina Lise and Talhand, a result of finding out about the displacement incident. The three would then travel to the demon continent, Meet up with Roxy's parents where she could confirm Season that they one really stuff. did love her, then encounter Kashirika and find out about Zenith. These were the memories Roxy recounted all in this instant, and they reminded her even more of why she wanted to live. So, 
as she thought relentlessly about how she didn't want to die. The last thing she would think of was actually of how she wouldn't be able to see her parents anymore. Aww. It's what I assume is the biggest regret of her life, since in her final moments, it's what her mind came to first. Parents are important. Talking about parents, it's gonna be Father's Day tomorrow, right? And uh, a certain father in our show right now is tripping a lot of death flags, so let's just uh, be mentally prepared for that tomorrow, because I think everyone can guess who's gonna die if a character dies next episode. Of course, that's when Rudy would come in and save her, and that's how Roxy survived the labyrinth. It wasn't so much this struggle to find resources and survive, but rather this exercise in perseverance and determination. She very well could have spent weeks on end inside her little bunker, but instead chose to venture out and continue fighting. The resolve it's to survive. It's an interesting tale of survival that I think tells a lot about Roxy. One yeah, that strong I girl. deserved its own video. Luckily, the cut content from last episode wasn't actually very much, but there is one thing that I feel is worth mentioning. Hmm? It's that Rudy didn't actually know how he figured out where Roxy was. He sniffed. Tanjiro Demon Slayer GPS knows like sniffing. Intuition? Drop of water falling down. He smelled the one-month unwashed sacred relic and knew immediately. How did he know? Yes, he did mention how he smelled her, but mm. that feeling of imminent danger which he also felt alongside it was something more than just intuition. Imminent Had danger, he, he could sense she that? Was in danger like the way he, he could sense the danger that she was in. How? Did then he wouldn't have torn down wall after wall to get to her, and by the time he found her, he would have been too late. It was a case of convenient timing that Rudy couldn't just consider lucky. Perhaps it was in Hello? fact the bond he'd made with her, or... A bond we made with her as a child. Hmm. I mean, where are you fucking using magic in this world? I shouldn't really question. I'm just looking for an actual, like, logical reasoning of how he could understand. But maybe a bond as master disciple at such a young age, maybe? Or perhaps it was something more like the man god intervening. I mean, if Anon uses gonna go out of his way in a spoiler, no spoiler anime only, you know, content and suggest of his own opinion that man god might have done it. I'm just gonna assume that the man god did fucking do it then. Either way, whether Roxy or the man god- Like, 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 like think, think about this, right? Think about this. Any news is making cut content stuff for the anime only people to know. Clearly any news knows what the fuck happened, right? He doesn't read ahead? Really? So even right now, him po you know, positioning Mangot as the, you know, the option of how we knew, I, I, I felt like this is him like kind of just softly suggesting, like not softly suggesting, he's you know, heavily fucking suggesting that it was, it was the Mangot. But it's just like, hey, what if the Mangot did it, guys? You know, it's just like, uh, hmm, I wonder. And this goes then to double down on the theory that Mangot, uh, Mangot, uh, actually wanted Rudy to go to um, Begarit and save Zenith. Even though he said we would regret it because this was uh, reverse psychology. So for the first time, man got actually, you know, um, kind of, I don't want to say it, for the first time he lied, but for the first time, his actual true option of where he wanted Rudy to go was the opposite. And if this is also true with Rudy, with Roxy shit, then I'd be like, you know what? Man God, man God. It was for sure some sort of divine intervention. But yeah, that's, that's how Roxy survived and was saved. I hope you enjoyed hearing more about her, and I hope you'll join me next week for the big battle that we all know is coming. Oh boy, tomorrow, Father's Day. Guys, please go give Mr. Andy News a like on his video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and maybe call your dad if you're living you know, away from home, because like I said, I think we all fucking know what is going to happen next episode with the ridiculous amount of death flags that are not even implicit. They're explicitly saying, these are some famous last words, dads. Let's get, let's get mentally prepared for that.